Hello, I'm Václav Novotný and welcome to the tutorial of Decentralized Systems 1. This tutorial will be focused on renewables, specifically for solar power and solar thermal systems. In this tutorial, we will talk about renewable resources for use in domestic or industrial applications. So these are basically two, and those are solar thermal and photovoltaic. Eventually you can have combination of photovoltaic system with a solar thermal system. Renewable resources are of course resources as hydro and wind, but these two sources are only rarely usable in applications that we are going to talk about here. And also they are largely addressed in other courses. Other renewable resource is the geothermal power, which for the domestic and industrial decentralized energy systems is also considered to be used in form of heat pumps, specifically ground source heat pumps, uh, where you are using the natural heat flow from the earth core to the crust. And for the heat pumps and mainly industrial heat pumps, we will have, however, a separate tut tutorial. So now, when we talk about solar energy, we have an illustrative map here of the solar energy yearly potential, where we have the annual global irradiation in the units kilowatt hours per square meter. And you can see that the highest values of solar irradiation are in the southern parts, like in this uh, map, northern Africa, near east, and south of Spain, eventually south of Italy. Here the values are more than 2 megawatt hours per square meter of the energy received in a year. When we look at the central Europe, let's say around uh, Czechia, so we see that the values are a little bit above 1000 kilowatt hours per square meter, which means about half of the southern regions. Interestingly, you can see quite high values of solar irradiation here in the Alps, which is given by the high altitude, so that means also higher portion of the UV wavelength, also probably lower amount of clouds, and those are southern slopes. Then when we look, would look at the northern Europe, let's say the northern Scandinavia or the Iceland, so we can see that the values are somewhere around 900 kilowatt hours per square meter. It however doesn't say how much of that energy you are able to use in your system. Now at first we will be looking at the solar thermal collectors, where the types of these collectors are flat plate, either unglazed or glazed, and vacuum tube collectors. Then you can have some form of concentration of the solar irradiation, which for the collectors for relatively lower temperatures, let's say like vacuum tube, you can add some reflectors. Or for higher temperatures, there are systems with mirrors such as parabolic mirror dish, parabolic mirror trough, and mirror array with central receiver. Now for the more commonly applied uh, solar thermal collectors, they look in a way how you can see over here. But the energy balance that we will now explain is valid basically for all solar thermal collectors. So we are having some solar irradiation input over here, where the solar radiation goes into the collector. And now what happens with that energy flow? Part of that radiation, basically the stream of photons, gets reflected on the surface. So it's this first loss over here, the reflection on glazing. Then inside is some absorber that is supposed to absorb the sol uh, solar irradiation, the photons, 
and convert it to thermal energy by heating up. Even though uh, this is typically very dark material with low, ref low reflectivity, so still some portion of the energy gets reflected and it's under other loss. And then, even if it would be, uh, if it, even if it would have zero reflectivity, and even if it would be absolute black body, so still it would have some radiation towards the surrounding. So it's the glazing thermal loss over here, mostly by radiation, but also some convection due to its temperature. Then, the whole area inside the collector is heating up, so the whole collector has temperature higher than the environment, and it has some, therefore it has, even though there is lots of insulation, it has some convective thermal loss, mostly taking place through the back and side walls. And now, what is left out of that is the heat that gets transferred into the heat transfer fluid, typically some non-freezing liquids, which is transferred out of the collector for our use. Now let's have a look at the losses and efficiency with respect to some parameters of the collectors. So here on the y-axis we have the collector efficiency and on the x-axis we have temperature difference between mean collector temperature and the ambient temperature. So for example if the ambient temperature is 40 degrees C and our collector would be 40 degrees C so it would be zero. If the ambient would be 40 degrees C and the collector would be 80 degrees C so here we would be at 40 plus uh, here we would be at 80 minus 40 which is 40 over here. So no matter what is the temperature of the collector, whether it has some heat losses or not. So there is some optic loss. Those were the reflections. Then, if there is no temperature difference between the collector and the surroundings, so the collector has theoretically the highest efficiency. It is the point over here. And now, as the temperature of the fluid in the collector and thus also temperature of the collector increase, so do increase the thermal losses and the curve of the efficiency with the difference in temperatures between the collector and the ambient goes lower. Now the collector has almost the same thermal loss as absolute thermal loss regardless of the solar irradiation. Once the mean fluid temperature in the collector is 30 degrees C higher than the ambient, there would be the certain value of uh, the heat loss, but as the solar irradiation increases, so does the amount of the heat we can use from the collector increase with the same value of the loss. So the efficiency of the collector increases as well. Now let's have a look at different types of the collectors. Let's say from the so-called mass-produced uh, range or products, which are for relatively lower temperatures, typically used for most of the applications. So first, we have the angle we have the collector with unglazed absorber with the ambient wind speed uh, 0 meters per second and is the curve over here. It has the highest efficiency at this theoretical point where the temperature of the collector is exactly at the ambient temperature so it doesn't have any thermal losses. The, the highest efficiency is here because it does not have the losses from the glazing by the reflection. But as it is unglazed, so the thermal losses significantly increase once the temperature increases. 
and therefore the decrease of the efficiency is very sharp. Also, once there is certain wind speed, so the term losses get even more pronounced and the efficiency is even lower. Then we have the flat plate collectors with glazing and we have non-selective over here and selective absorber. The selective absorber means that it absorbs certain wavelengths better than other and also emits the light differently at different wavelengths so that the amount of energy that is retained by the collector is in the selective case higher. The glazed collectors were applicable only for very low temperature differences from the ambient so uh, typically something like swimming pools. These flat plate collectors are typically applied for utility hot water and heating. We can see the temperature difference from let's say 20 to 70 degrees C. Once we would like to have the temperatures higher we could partly use the selective flat plate collectors but even better would be vacuum tube collectors which are better insulated. As they are better insulated the thermal losses are not that high so at high temperature differences the efficiency is higher but at the low temperature differences because of this extra glazing because of other surfaces on which the irradiation can be reflected there are high optic losses and the efficiency would be lower and we have comparison of two different types which differ in detail of their mechanical construction now just for illustration here are also shown some thermal collectors for high temperature applications typically for concentrated solar power plants where these are the systems optimized for these high temperatures so we can see also the values of efficiency are relatively high and the previous let's say must produced collectors had the maximum at the zero temperature difference around 70 to 80 percent and only the vacuum tube collectors had efficiency at the 150 degrees C in positive values here around 40%. So here we are in the range of 55 to 75 and for much higher temperatures let's say 300 to 550 degrees C but again you can see the same trend that the lower temperatures provide higher efficiency. As these applications are for power plants, so you might know that on the other hand higher temperatures provide better efficiency of the cycle. So the application ends up as the optimization problem between preferring efficiency of the collectors and preferring efficiency of the cycle, what is the best temperature of the heat transfer fluid from the collectors. Also keep in mind that this Tm is the mean temperature difference. So Tm is the temperature of the outlet from the collector of the heat, uh, of the heat transfer fluid of the outlet plus temperature at the inlet divided by 2. So for example if you have heating system at temperatures let's say 80 to 60 degrees C nowadays the typical heating systems are lower but let's say for some industry or for older household applications so the mean temperature would be 80 plus 60 divided by 2 which is 70 degrees C so it would be over here if you would have some low temperature heating system 
you would have 55 to 35 degrees C. So then the mean temperature in the collector is 55 plus 35 divided by 2 which is 45 degrees C over here and you can see that even the non-selective flat plate collector would get some efficiency but still the selective would be better. Okay now how we calculate the losses and efficiency of the collector. So at first point we have the heat input into the collector from the solar irradiation and this heat put is determined from, from some irradiation G over here in the units watts per square meter where the T stands for the irradiation normal to the surface that means if we have some collector we have a sun and the direction of the solar irradiation would be this one so from certain value of the irradiation G over here the normal irradiation would be only this portion. So that's what the normal or here with the T stands for. And then we have the B which is for beam like direct irradiation. Then we have the diffuse light and then we have the refle reflected light from surrounding environment. Then we have some K over here with V for angle and respective to B for the beam irradiation, D for diffuse and R for reflected. These are incidence angle modifiers which basically say how much of the normal irradiation can the collector use. So in this bracket we have still units watts per square meter because the incidence angle modifiers have unit of 1 then it is multiplied by the optical efficiency eta O or eta 0 over here still watts per square meter and then when we multiply it by the area of the collectors or of the collector aperture the active part of the collector we get watts. Now the heat loss of the collector. The heat losses are given by two coefficients A1 and A2 where the A1 is coefficient of convective losses so you can see it's some coefficient times the temperature difference between mean temperature and ambient temp temperature and then the A2 is the coefficient of radiation losses. So, and this value in the brackets would be again per square meter, so it's multiplied by the aperture area, the effective area of the collector. So the difference between these two is then the net heat output of the collector, which also needs to be the mass flow rate of the heat transfer fluid multiplied by difference in the enthalpies at the inlet and outlet. Now when we have a look at the efficiency of the collector, so the output is clear. It's the input minus the losses. But we are div dividing it by the total irradiation beam diffuse plus reflected multiplied by the aperture area of the collector. The total amount of energy that falls on the collector. Total collector radiation multiplied by the aperture area. So now we can cancel out the aperture areas, perhaps manipulate the variables a bit and we get that the collector efficiency is the optical efficiency of the collector when the mean temperature of the fluid in the collector would be same as the ambient 
and minus two members. One is the a1 as over here, the coefficient of convective losses multiplied by the temperature difference divided by the irradiation and minus a2, the coefficient of radiation losses multiplied by the temperature difference square divided by the solar radiation. Now, as I was talking about the incidence and angle modifiers, so we can see them over here in the left figure for evacuated tube collector without reflector, flat plate collector and evacuated tube collector with reflector. So for the flat plate collector, as the angle at which the radiation incidence is lower, so the amount of the reflected heat, uh, sorry, ref reflected radiation would be higher and therefore the incidence angle modifier is getting lower up to the end point where the angle of the irradiation is so low that basically no heat, uh, no energy will get absorbed, absorbed by the collector. Now when we have the evacuated tube without reflector, the AP, the blue line, so the reflector actually causes, because the reflector typically looks somewhat like this, we have the evacuated tube itself and we have the reflector behind them. So as the angle gets a little bit lower, so actually the area from which like this uh, from which the radiation is still reflected into the absorber gets higher than if it would be direct normal irradiation. So this was the case with reflector, the red one, and without reflector the fact is that as you have the evacuated tubes next to each other, so some of the radiation can get reflected between the absorber tubes and when, when you will have normal radiation so some portion of the radiation would just go through get to the back plate of the collector and just get reflected back so therefore for the Tube evacuated tube collectors, both with reflector and without reflector, the incidence angle modifier actually cause, has slight increase in the angles uh, angles of the impact lower when the irradiation heading is more inclined. And what does it cause? It can be seen here on the right hand side where we have the course of the day which changes the incidence angle and for the flat plate collector we have standard uh, rising tendency peak around the noon and then decreasing tendency but for the evacuated tube collector we can see that we have sharper tendency then actually even slight decrease in the incidence angle modifier up to certain point where again the decrease uh, dec steep decree decrease uh, will follow so it helps to spread a little bit the amount of energy that is obtained from the collectors during different hours so as we would have time of the day and uh, heat output of the collector so the flat plate collector would have probably typical shape as this while for the 
collector with evacuated cubes. There would be still the highest radiation at noon and lower radiation at different parts of the day, but thanks to the incidence angle modifier, the curve would look probably something like this. Here we can see another sh uh, shape of some incidence angle modifiers. Again, we have the reference flat plate. And here we have the transverse incidence angle modifier for the cylindrical absorber with reflector and without reflector. Where in this case, you can see something similar, just the turning point was not that fast. And here you can see even slight decrease of the incidence angle modifier up to the point of, let's say, 45 degrees. Okay, so now we will calculate an example with the solar thermal collectors, where we will consider vacuum tube collectors with following parameters. The optical efficiency, 75%. The coefficients A1, 1.5 watts per square meter and Kelvin, A2, 0 0.005, and you can see the unit is watt per square meter and square Kelvin, so that the units fit with the square Kelvin in the formula. The aperture area will be 1.2 meters square. We will consider normal direct radiation, therefore there will uh, be no incidence angle modifiers and we will also neglect diffuse and reflected light for simplicity. And we will assume the solar irradiation to be 1000 watts per square meter, which is achievable on nice sunny day around noon. And then second case where we will have lower solar irradiation about 700 watts per square meter. Still relatively high. Also we will consider two cases with respect to ambient temperature which would be 0 degrees C and 30 degrees C. Let's say temperature for winter operation and temperature for summer operation. And then at last, we will want to calculate the collector efficiency and power output for mean fluid temperature being at, at first 50 degrees C. So that means temperatures for, let's say, domestic heating and generally some heating purposes and utility water. And then 120 degrees C, which is usable for industrial applications. So in the calculations, let's start with the boundary conditions, which are the optical efficiency at a zero, which was 0 0.75, where the unit is one, then the coefficient of Thermal loss A1, 1.5 watts per square meter and Kelvin. Coefficient A2, which was 0 0.005 watts per square meter and Kelvin square, is the coefficient associated mainly with the radiation losses. And the aperture area of the collector is 1.2 square meters. And now we have several cases of the other boundary conditions. So let's have the case. We will have case number 1 to 8.
where we have the solar irradiation normal to the collector surface which was 1700 watts per square meter so 1000 and 700 watts per square meter then we had several cases two cases of the external or ambient temperature which was 0 and 30 degrees C and finally the mean uh, fluid temperature in the collector TM or TMC which was 50 and 120 degrees C 50 for case for some relatively lower temperature heating or utility water heating and 120 for some use as industrial heat so 50, 120 50, 20, 50 and 50 and 120 degrees C okay so these are the boundary conditions that we will have and now we can calculate the collector parameters so first let's get the heat input which is in units watts so the heat input into the collector is the collector irradiation normal to the collector area multiplied by the aperture area of the collector. So this is incidence irradiation and then multiplied by the optical efficiency to exclude the reflected heat, uh, reflected radiation, reflected energy. And for use in the other cases, we can lock these two values. Now we have the heat loss of the collector. Again, the units are watts. And the heat loss is uh, the aperture area multiplied by and now the coefficient of thermal loss A1, which is related to primarily convective heat loss, multiplied by the temperature difference between the collector, mean, mean temperature, mean fluid temperature at the collector, and the ambient temperature. And then plus the radiation loss, which is the coefficient A2, multiplied by the temperature difference between the collector and ambient. And this is squared, this temperature difference. So we have heat input into the collector. 900 watts, the heat loss 105 watts. And maybe just for illustration, we can also have the irradiation energy, which would be the surface area times the solar irradiation. So we can see the energy impacting the collector is 1.2 kilowatts. Inside of the collector gets 900 watts and from that 100 watts is uh, lost as the thermal loss. 
Now we can calculate the collector term output. Q collector or Q collector net, which is the difference between the heat input and term loss. So we can see that from 1.2 kilowatts we get 800 watts of thermal output and we can get the efficiency of the collector as the ratio of the output to impacting energy and here we have watts and here we have one as the unit So even for this case, where we have very high solar irradiation, but uh, external temperature 0 degrees C and relatively small temperature of the fluid in the collector, we get efficiency of 66%. Now just to use these formulas further on, let's log the parameters from the boundary conditions which are same for all the cases so it's the aperture area coefficient a1 and coefficient a2 over here and here also for the irradiation energy the aperture area and now we can extend the formulas to all of our cases and we can see how the parameters are changing. So the highest efficiency of the collector is when we have the lowest uh, fluid temperature and highest outer temperature so that there are smallest heat losses. In this case we can see only 40 watts. So the collector efficiency is about 70%. On the other hand, when we have just slightly lower solar irradiation 700 watts per square meter and the uh, outer temperature is zero so this would be something probably something like peak of winter day when we want to use the collectors to get uh, relatively high temperature heat at 120 degrees C the collector at this peaking point would have efficiency only about 40 percent so for out of 800 watts of the impacting energy, 630 gets into the collector and about half of that is lost uh, to the surroundings. Now as the last thing, let's calculate the mass flow rate of the heat transfer fluid if it would be water and if the temperature difference of the heat transfer fluid would be let's say 20 degrees C like relatively standard value for the heating systems so delta T heating water 20 kelvins and we want mass flow rate of the heating water per in kilograms per hour so for that we use the equation M uh, Q is here Q is M C P delta T we will assume the water with C P of 4.2 uh, kilojoules per kilogram and Kelvin or 4200 joules per kilogram Kelvin so the mass flow rate in kilograms per second would be the heat output Q divided by CP delta T CP is 4.2 times 1000 in watts per uh, kilogram and Kelvin times the temperature difference 20 degrees C and we get kilograms per second And like this we get kilograms per hour. So we can see that 
for example for the preparation of high temperature heat 120 degrees C uh, when it's the peak uh, there are peak parameters of the collector we would need almost 26 kilograms per hour per one collector and uh, when the solar irradiation would be slightly lower also for this case of winter day we have just 14 or for the compared to the summer case and nice uh, nice temp uh, nice parameters 1000 kilogram 1000 watts per square meter and 30 degrees C it would be more than double so for controlling of the heat transfer fluid uh, flow rate we will definitely need some controllable pump with variable frequency drive or something like that now what happens if we would decrease the solar irradiation even more not just let's say 700 but something which can be achieved in morning or evening hours or let's say in not so nice weather in winter 400 watts per square meter so the efficiency of the collector for high temperatures can drop even to just 12% for low temperature of, uh, of the heating water we still have about 50 but for the high temperatures just 12% and if you want to use this heat so we need to have the controllable range of the mass flow rate between here 30 kilograms per hour down to 2.5 so less than 10 percent okay so this was the calculation of the solar thermal collectors now we will move to the modeling of photovoltaic panels or photovoltaic modules so here it's direct conversion of the radiation into electricity but the issue is that the efficiency of the photovoltaic panels are strong function of the panel temperature and then it's slightly also changing with the absolute value of the normal irradiation so first let's have a look at the equation for the panel efficiency over here where the efficiency of the photovoltaic module is some referenced efficiency and now it's multiplied by 1 plus some coefficient times temperature of the module plus 25 the 25 is just a correction to a ref reference with respect to which the values are reported and somehow we will need to get the temperature of the photovoltaic module over here it's the TPV and then it's multiplied by the coefficient beta which is the parameter of the photovoltaic panel that provides information how much the efficiency is decreasing with the temperature so for the reference efficiencies we can see it for several types of the photovoltaic panels here polycrystalline amorphous and monocrystalline multi-junction panels with the values going from 6 to 23 percent and here this coefficient gives idea or gives the parameter how much the efficiency will decrease or increase based on the temperature and now we have the last member over here 1 plus 0 0.03 times logarithm of the solar irradiation normal to the area of the photovoltaic panel divided by 1000 which is some 
rather empirical relationship of changing the collector efficiency with respect to uh, the value of the irradiation. So now the solar irradiation is given from the weather conditions. The value of the reference efficiency is given. The value of the beta of the temperature efficiency coefficient is also given. So now we need to somehow obtain the temperature of the module. So now we will consider for obtaining the temperature following simplified energy balance model. We have the photovoltaic panel. We have some solar radiation and the photovoltaic module produces some of the electricity given by its efficiency and it produces or produces uh, rest of the energy from the solar radiation comes out as a heat out as a heat rejected into the ambient and also part of the energy from the solar radiation would get reflected. So first for the reflected heat we will use some coefficient of reflectivity and this coefficient will be used in the formula over here where we have the reflectivity for the reference case and then we have some coefficient B0 and most importantly we have the angle phi of the solar radiance over here. So from the reference reflectivity we will get actual reflectivity uh, for the given angle. We call it reflectivity phi and then we can obtain the temperature of the photovoltaic module approximately from this where at first for simplicity because the efficiency of the collectors is relatively low so we will say that the work output is approximately zero and then the solar radiation minus the reflected radiation needs to be the thermal loss of the collector uh, of the photovoltaic module and from this we can get that also the well, the heat is basically the heat loss is basically some coefficient of heat transfer times the difference between the temperature of the photovoltaic and temperature of the ambient and if it's absolute value so multiplied by some area and the area is also necessary to get the energy input from the irradiation because the G is per square meter so the areas can cancel out and uh, G minus G reflected can be written as G times 1 minus the reflectivity. So after all we can get that the temperature of the photovoltaic module would be the ambient temperature plus 1 minus reflectivity the uh, actual irradiation input total irradiation minus the reflection divided by the heat transfer coefficient alpha and for some simplified calculations we have here a very simple empirical relationship for the heat transfer coefficient alpha uh, based on wind speed where the basic value is 5.7 watts per square meter and with each meter per second of the wind u it gets another 3.8 watts per square meter. So here we have an example of 
photovoltaic module calculation that we will do where we will consider following parameters. We will consider the three different types of solar panels, the monocrystalline multijunction, basically the most expensive thing you can get, the polycrystalline, let's say standard, and amorphous, cheap but uh, low efficiency panels. We will assume that all of them will have the same area of 1.6 square meter. For simplicity we will consider the direct normal radiation and neglect the effects of diffuse and reflected light or changing the reflectance of the panel between different types. If the irradiation would not be normal, so same as in the solar thermal collectors, you would need some geometric model based on the time of the day and time of the year to get the angle of the solar irradiation and then by goniometric functions get the normal irradiation. You will assume that this normal irradiation is either 1000 or 700 uh, watts per square meter. The ambient temperature will be again for two cases, 0 and 30 degrees C, similarly as we had for the solar therm thermal collectors. And at the end we will consider two wind speeds, 2 meters per second, which is nearly no wind at all, and 10 meters per second, which is quite a strong wind. And we will want to get the the temperature of the PV panel, efficiency and the power output. And before we do that, just one last thing for the calculation principles. Once we obtain the temperature of the photovoltaic module, we can get some of the actual efficiency, we can get the power production, and then, then once power production is not zero, while power production has certain uh, numbers, so we can recalculate the whole problem where we will have G times 1 minus rho would be alpha times delta T plus the electrical output and basically would end up adding here minus the electrical output divided by the area. Okay, but now let's get to the calculation of this PV system. In the calculation, let's start with the summarizing of the boundary conditions for different cases. There we have cases 1 to 8. for each photovoltaic module or for each type of the technology of the module and we have the normal solar irradiation in watts per square meter where we had 1000 and 700 then the second parameter was the outer temperature where we had cases 0 and 30 degree C Then we had two cases of the wind speed, two meters per second, ten meters per second, So these are the general boundary conditions common for 
all of the cases. Then we can also add the area of the module. which was 1.6 square meters. And before we get to the calculations specific for each type of technology, uh, let's we can also have uh, one parameter where, which is common for all the cases and it's the heat transfer coefficient based on the wind speed. So it's, let's call it for example alpha and we will use the empirical correlation which was that the heat transfer coefficient would be 5.7 plus the wind speed times 3.8 with the units watts per square meter and Kelvin. So for 2 meters per second we have 13.3 and when the wind speed is high, like 10 meters per second, so it's about uh, almost 4 times that much, 40 watts per, 44 watts per square meter and Kelvin. And also among the common parameters we can add the reflectivity. Uh, reflectivity coefficient ref uh, reference reflectivity rho ref as 0 0.05 now let's go into the specific technology so let's start with the monocrystalline photovoltaic module where we have the parameters reference efficiency of 23% then the coefficient beta which was 4.5% per Kelvin so it's 0 0.0045 with the units 1 over Kelvin now let's get the estimation of the photovoltaic module temperature assuming that the electrical output would be zero and also we have the simplification that we are neglecting the uh, change the reflectivity with different angles of incidence of the radiation so the temperature of the photovoltaic module is the outer temperature plus uh, now the impacted energy per square meter which is the solar irradiation but multiplied by 1 minus reference reflectivity And this is divided by the heat transfer coefficient. So we get the estimation of the temperature of the photovoltaic module as 71 degrees C. Now we can estimate the efficiency of the photovoltaic module which is which is the reference efficiency multiplied by 1 plus coefficient beta multiplied by temperature of the module plus 25 and multiplied by 1 plus 0 0.03 times 
natural logarithm of radians divided by And we can have it in percents. So we can see that the efficiency from the reference value of 23% dropped just to 13%. What cost it? Basically everything that cost it is just the temperature because this part 1 plus the uh, coefficient uh, of efficiency decrease with temperature times the temperature difference is 0 0.57 and the second member over here because we have logarithm of 1000 divided by 1000 so it's logarithm of 1 logarithm of 1 is 0 so this second part would be just 1 the 1 over here now this was the estimation of the efficiency if the power output would be uh, zero. Now the power output of the system would be electrical power output is just the efficiency of the photovoltaic module multiplied by the solar irradiance normal to the panel surface and multiplied by the area of the module. And we get value of 208 watts. Now we can extend these results for the rest of the cases. So this is referenced over here. This value needs to have the referenced uh, efficiency of the or locked the efficiency of the reference case and the coefficient beta. And this one has already locked the uh, surface area of the module. So now we ex extend these results. We get the efficiency for different cases, where you can see that the highest efficiency is 18%, where we get 300 watts out of the system, when we have high solar irradiance, and very low temperature and high wind speed which helps to cool down the photovoltaic module which is now at temperature 21 degrees C. If we want to get the more precise values so let's have the temperature of the photovoltaic module which would be guessed. At first we will start for example with the values that we have over here and then we will have the temperature of the photovoltaic module which would be iterated or corrected. Then for the purpose of the iterations we will have the temperature difference all these parameters will be with degrees Celsius as the units and here we would have corrected efficiency of the photovoltaic module and the electrical output so now for the iterated uh, value of the temperature let's put copy the formula from here but we will add the subtraction of the uh, 
electrical output of the module divided by the surf surface area like this now the temperature difference is difference in these two the corrected efficiency of the module let's copy this value over here but use the temperature over here or the guest temperature it doesn't matter in this case and the corrected electrical power output would be referenced to the efficiency in here now this is the gas so it will be input and we can use the solver in Microsoft Excel set objective of this difference as zero by changing the cell the temperature of the gas temperature of the photovoltaic module and when we solve it we can see that the efficiency increased by one percentage point uh, because the actual temperature of the photovoltaic module is about 10 degrees C lower than it was before and we get 220 watts instead of 208 watts but at the same time you can see that the uh, first estimate where the work output or electrical output was neglected was quite accurate if we do the same thing with the rest of the values we will get values that we have in here so the highest efficiency instead of 18 percent increased 18.2 increased to 18.6 and generally the increase is typically significantly less than one percentage point so the first estimate can be considered as quite accurate given the uh, other assumptions that we did in this calculation And just when we look at, for example, the efficiency at the, let's say, let's have a look here at the lowest efficiency, or actually the lowest one is over here, but uh, in the case of lowest power output, 142 watts out of the uh, whole module. So we can see that out of reference value of 23%, we get uh, less than 13 so more than 10 percentage point drop in the efficiency and the calculation of the efficiency over here is a result of in the calculation of efficiency We have relatively high temperature of the photovoltaic module so this member of the calculation would be about 0 0.5 and then we have also some decrease uh, due to the lower than reference irradiation from the logarithm in here where it's 700 divided by 1000 now again we can check what would happen if we decrease the solar irradiation from 700 to just 400 
which will anyway happen in some early or later uh, hours of the day. And well, don't take into account these iterated calculations because we would need to do the reiteration again. But you can see how the actually efficiency could sometimes a little bit increase because the temperature would not be that high. But the power output of the module further decreases because of the low irradiation. So this was the first monocrust line module and we can do the same for the other modules. So now we will do the same thing with the polycrystalline photovoltaic module. So actually the temperature of the photovoltaic module is based uh, just on the parameters which are universal here. So we can take the temperature as the same and we directly calculate the efficiency of the conversion where we can actually take the function for the efficiency from here and copy it here and just the only thing that we will change which are specific to the polycrystalline module are the reference efficiency and the coefficient of uh, efficiency decrease with temperature. So the reference efficiency for the polycrystalline module is 15% and here the coefficient beta was 4% per Kelvin, so 0.004 yeah, of course, minus. So now, for the efficiency function, we just change the reference of these two coefficients. And we get the values of the efficiency for our cases. So we can see that the efficiency dropped from, for the first case, from 13 to 9 and in similar manner also for the rest of the, rest of the cases and therefore also the power production would drop where the power production would be Just efficient, take efficiency in here. So for the first case, we would get 150 watts instead of 225. And for the lowest power production, we would get 100 watts instead of 140. And lastly, let's do the same thing with the amorphous photovoltaic modules. So the coefficients, the reference efficiency of the amorphous PV panels is very small, it's only 6%, but also the coefficient of decrease of performance with temperature is smaller, it was just 2%. Now we have the formatting here, and let's get the functions. Copy the function from the previous, and Again, change the referencing to the parameters specific to the amorphous photovoltaic module. 
and let's do the same for the power production like this so what we can see lastly here for the amorphous PV modules is that the efficiency is well of course it's very low but also thanks to the low coefficient beta the changes in the efficiency are not that high and also that because of that the spread in the power output based on different uh, parameters with different uh, irradiation and different temperatures eventually different wind speeds different cooling of the system of the modules is not that high where we can see the lowest values being right above 50 while the highest values being uh, less than 90. Lastly the efficiency in the polycrystalline for the polycrystalline uh, modules case and especially for the amorphous case is very close to the actual efficiency because as the efficiency is smaller so the error that we make by uh, having the temperature of the module a little bit higher neglecting in the balance equation for the temperature calculation the power output uh, so the error gets smaller and therefore the values get more precise and since in the case of monocrystalline PV modules we had the values always lower than one percentage points so here it will be most likely within half percentage points for most of the cases in designing of some solar system for uh, some actual application so just please keep in mind that the rather possibly complicated or very important part is to get the value of the normal irradiation you can have either some models based on the solar movement uh, throughout the year and throughout the day and uh, some coefficients of the solar radiations due to the clouds or there are also some programs that can help you to calculate this value based on the slope based on the azimuth of the surface and for any time of the day any day of the year so that's all for this tutorial about solar systems